So, to begin with, uh, then and now, so how does all this start? Well, the first thing I'm going to talk about here is I'm going to use some photographs just to illustrate some points. Um, so we'll start with the picture that I had before. Obviously, this is the slightly embarrassing one of me. Uh, I started out in the mid-90s as a graphics op, actually in the early 90s. I actually began work with a company called Aston Electronic Designs. Uh, this is me operating an FX Deco, if anybody remembers one of those. Uh, That's a graphics machine. I used to start with the graphics stuff. Um, the Aston environment that I used to work in as a graphics op looked a lot like this. So you can see we've got a lot of CRT monitors, <laughs> strange keyboards with little tracker balls. It was very cool. Chroma wheels and all that stuff. Um, but mostly everything was very, very analog because it was very analog. Um, so to talk about that analogness a little bit more, um, let me get rid of my embarrassing history and bring on some other embarrassing histories. So this actually is, uh, there's a great channel on YouTube uh, where they bring back to life some old OB trucks from the BBC. If you go and search for it, I'll, I'll have to post it in the notes afterwards. But, um, but this is actually an old OB truck uh, from the BBC from, I believe, the late 60s. Um, and you can see it pretty much looks like a normal OB truck as they stand today, obviously a little bit more high tech. But, uh, but uh, you know, you have a vision mixer here, you've got the audio and the engineering down the back there. It's a very, very similar um, setup. CRT monitors, obviously, etc. And also uh, when it comes to post-production as well here. So uh, I spent a lot of time in edit suites in the 90s. That was a crazy place to be. Uh, this is what edit suites actually looked like back then. Um, so just to give you some sense of it, because when you're playing around with Adobe Premiere or something like that now, on this non-linear environment where you're just you know, drag dropping clips, it was nothing like that. You would have um, a couple of player machines. Here's a player machine and here's a player machine. Uh, and then you'd have some record machines here. Uh, I think these probably, one is for the main record and one is for the dub. And these would be controlled using RS-232 or some kind of protocol by this edit controller that sits down here. Then you'd have an audio desk and you'd have a vision mixer to be able to assemble it. And then in front of the editor, you had this like time code monitor where you'd see all your time codes. So the editors, they were like rock stars. They were amazing because they could do all this maths in their head and you know, they could type in different numbers and tapes would fire up and it would, it would be quite a spectacular thing to watch. Also here they have scopes so they can see the audio and the levels of the video because in uh, analog uh, world, you had to be very careful about how the levels were for not breaking transmission, etc. And finally, you can see here, <laughs> Tapes, yes, tapes. Lots of beta SPs tape when I started and then we graduated on to DigiBeta where the tapes became less analog, more digital. Uh, and we had pre-roll, anyone remember pre-roll? That was fun. Um, so, you know, all of this now has very much changed. It's a sync, like you can do all of this on your laptop now, all of it, or you could probably do it on your phone to be quite honest. But um, back then it was, a, it was a really specialized skilled job because an editor had to be not only good at the vision mixing but also good at the audio as well as all of the uh, tape machines and doing the maths and uh, yeah they were real rock stars it was quite an amazing job that they had so um what i'm going to do because it's a whiteboard wednesday is i'm just going to start uh, drawing out how things used to be uh, and as I said in the notes, it's going to be a bit like a journey. So I'm going to take you, you know, from the past through the present into what the future holds. Um, so what I'm going to do is, is demonstrate how somebody at home, for instance, here, might, oh, I've got a double pen. Somebody here at home might have a TV and on their TV appears uh, a news reader reading a news story. OK, and that's to this TV here. So let's draw Okay, the question is, how does that story, so here's the story, okay, I don't know what the story is, but any story, cat eats dog or something like that, here's the story, how does the story get from here over to the TV set? What's the process between these two places that happens when uh, you're actually making uh, broadcast news and using your, your back to <laughs> erase things? Uh, right, whiteboard Wednesdays, they're always fun. Right, okay, so uh, I'm going to draw a line down the middle. Now, the reason for that is there's two sides to this story, okay? So there's pre-production, uh, pre-production, I'm still getting used to using this whiteboard, pre-production, and there's uh, post-production in here as well, uh, and this normally is the newsroom. So um, I'm actually going to call it the newsroom, do that a bit too big, but we'll call it the newsroom for now. Okay, so in the newsroom, over here at this side, I'm just going to draw our news editor. So our news editor is in charge of everything that goes on in the newsroom. 
So everything goes through the news editor. So the news editor has seen that this story is going to happen. Now remember, we're going back in long time, early 90s, etc. The first thing a news editor would do would choose to run that story, and to run that story, they need to send a journalist and a cameraman and a sound person. Okay, so we would generally end up with about three people there. That's not actually changed that much over the years, to be quite honest. We can still see that today. Uh, the reason for that is that the sound boom and the camera, um, they're very important. That, you know, you've got to keep the picture good, you've got to get the sound quality good. That's very important. The most important thing in television is audio. That's really a fundamental thing. And here we have the journalist with their microphone, for instance. So they gather the story. And what they used to do is bring the story back in. So um, I'm just going to draw a line here to the edge of the newsroom here, for instance. So the journalists will come back to base with the story, uh, and they'll come back with some tapes, right? And those tapes would go into either the tape library or they would just go straight to the edit suite. I don't know, I'm just going to put the library there, just for the argument's sake. So the tapes go into the tape library, uh, and then the ENG crew, which stands for Electronic News Gathering, they would go back in the pool and probably go cover another story. But you can imagine there's lots of these journalists all coming in with different stories all the time. So there's a lot of stories coming in and tapes coming in. Uh, then the journalist would take that tape, or the tapes, as the rushes as we call them, to say Edit 1. Now Edit 1, a bit like the edit I uh, just showed you earlier on, <laughs> Edit 1 would be a big room, it would be very fancy, it would have a sofa, and it would have uh, pizza delivered and stuff like that. And unless you're a public sector broadcaster, it never happened at, at those. Uh, so they take the tapes into edit one, and they cut the story. So they actually genuinely cut the story. And then the editor, news editor would actually look at the story to define, A, where, where is its order in the running list? And also, um, do we actually want to use that story? Is it good enough, for instance? Okay. So uh, also, the journalist would probably write a script in here. Uh, and in the old days, they would either type it or use a word processor or something. But the scripts used to come in. Uh, certainly, as I remember, at a certain public broadcast, they had different colours of paper for different things. So uh, the scripts would just be like that. And of course, those scripts would then be handed over to uh, the news editor here. Very strange, I keep getting a double pen. Let me get rid of that. Okay. So, um, now we've got our finished tapes. On the other side of the line, we have what we would call production. Okay, so this is production. So production would consist mainly of two senior staff, and still does consist of two senior staff. Uh, it depends where you are in the world how they're called. Because in the UK, for instance, we would have a director and we would have a producer. But uh, they're the other way round, certainly in Scandinavia. But uh, it's very strange. But the roles, fundamentally, the roles are very important. So the director is in charge of the output and the producer is in charge of the stories and the talent, okay? So the producer never gets involved with, you know, what camera's going to be on it. Well, they shouldn't, but they <laughs> I've seen some arguments of it. Uh, but the producer shouldn't get involved with that process. The technical stuff is for the director. The director is the person who's basically uh, the, the be-all and end-all of anything. They're the ones that choose what goes out on the screen. So there's a, uh, a little powwow that goes on on the edge of this line where the news editor passes to the producer and the director the stories that they're going to use in the day. Now, this is where it gets super technical, so bear with me. Okay, we have a studio here, okay? So I'm going to draw a studio. It's only going to be a very small studio. And in the studio is the talent. And the talent is behind a little desk, okay? Bear in mind, this is the 90s. There were no virtual sets. Uh, lights used to pop off. It was very strange. Uh, so you would have in here a few cameras, of course. Um, I'm not very good at drawing cameras, but I'll draw three cameras. And the three cameras would just sit in there looking at the host. And the host, of course, would have a microphone or a, a lapel mic or a lavalier or whatever. Um, and they're in the studio. So that's, that's the, the, the new studio, effectively. Uh, sometimes you would have like a video wall or something at the back or a screen behind them. Um, but then we get into DVEs and DMEs, but I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, now, behind the studio, uh, we would have what is called the gallery. Now, this is an interesting thing, the gallery. Why is it called the gallery? Well, this is where all the technical stuff goes. And it's still, to this day, called the gallery in most places. Sometimes I'm seeing it starts to change, you know, the technical room or whatever people call it. But generally speaking, it's called a gallery. Now, the reason we call it a gallery is this, because... Back in the old days, when the BBC first fired this idea of making television up, 
They used to put the monitors on the wall like this. I mean, this is a multi-view. This is a pretty standard multi-view. But these used to be individual screens inside uh, the gallery. So, and it looked like a gallery of paintings. And hence, that's the reason why the gallery is called the gallery, because when you walked in, it looked like that. And it just looked like a, a gallery of paintings. So you can imagine that's a, an interesting word that's made it through all the years, even to where we are now. I need to take a breath. OK, so in the gallery, there are lots of things, lots of technical things. First of all, of course, you do have the, uh, the multi-view or the video wall. There'll be a giant video wall on the back here uh, that, as you saw just there, would show you all the sources coming in so they can see everything um, and all the VT players, A and B, and all the graphics. Everything that the director can choose from, they should be able to see on that, on that big video wall of uh, screens. And to, the, to this day, that's the same. Um, the biggest thing uh, and most important thing, you usually found that slightly off to the right here. So our director here would normally sit right in the middle, right in the middle of everybody. Uh, and here we would have a vision mixer. Okay, So the vision mixer is where all the video sources come in. Okay. I know there's a lot of technical people probably watching this who are going to say, what about the router? Yes, there's a router where we could, but basically, for, the, for keeping it simple, the vision mixer is where the vision stuff goes. So, for instance, these cameras go in camera one, camera two, camera three, and of course there's a button on there that corresponds to camera one, camera two, camera three, so that you can cut uh, on the bus, as we call it. Uh, so the vision mixer is very important, and uh, you would have a person here called a vision mixer, that would actually be their job title, uh, and they would push the buttons that the director tells them to do. So the director would say, come into camera two and camera two, and the vision mixer would push the button for camera two. So it literally somebody who took away the button pressing so the director could focus on the show instead of looking for buttons, for instance. You know. So uh, and, a very prestigious job. And this still exists today, and it's still a very prestigious job. I know I did it on the Eurovision. Those guys were amazing on the Eurovision. Uh, we even had uh, vision mixers for the ME buses on, on, the, on the vision mixer. So when you're live, it really helps to have a human there. Um, but at this time, everywhere had one of these. Um, then also down the back here, actually, I should draw it here, really. Um, you would have an audio room, and in the audio room, it's separated from everywhere so that the, uh, the sound mixer can hear properly and doesn't get distracted by the noise in the gallery. So they're actually isolated and soundproofed in here. But this is where they deal with, oops, this is where they deal with all the audio. So uh, let me just get that, whoop. Oh, whiteboard. Okay, so this is the uh, audio mixer. So the audio mixer will take in all of... Um, the microphone. So in the most simple case, the microphone of the host, OK? And uh, I'll, I'll add some stuff to this as we go along. So now we've got a, a vision mixer and an audio mixer. So we have pictures and we have sound. That's a good start, at least. What else do we need? Um, so the producer, for instance, will have uh, talkback. So we have talkback uh, still, again, important to this day, it, very important uh, comms. Uh, and that allows the producer to talk in the ear of the presenter, which allows the presenter, you know, if a breaking news comes in, you can often see them do that with their ear because they're listening to the producer telling them, OK, we've got to get off this, we're going to do something else. Quite a skill for the hosts because the skills can, that skill is important because they're able to listen to commands or information that's being fed to them while they're still reading the prompter. What's a prompter, I hear you say? OK, so a prompter is a piece of glass that sits in front of the cameras. M most time, actually, all the cameras but the prompter is fed, uh, I'm just going to draw that from up here. Uh, and back then, they were fairly new things, um, but uh, very useful. And all that they would do is put a, an, a CRT screen underneath the camera, and then there's a piece of glass with mirror on it at an angle, and that would reflect the words, but the camera lens wouldn't see it. So you could look right down the lens, because I've got a prompter in front of me here, and you can read the words, but to all intents and purposes to the viewers, they're just, uh, they don't see it. Uh, so the prompter, the producer, will be managing the script. And we would have a prompt operator as well here. And to this day, in some cases, you still do. Uh, and the prompt operator feeds these prompters in front of the cameras, just like that. So now we've got a vision mixer, audio mixer, and a prompter. I've forgotten to draw the audio person. Of course, there's an audio person. Very important people. Uh, now, not only do we have that, we also have, and uh, it can depend, um, I, in my opinion, it used to be here, but the VT op was always next to the vision mixer. So here we have VTs. Now, um, the VT operator used to have a list of time codes that was all set up 
um, by the journalist in the script, etc. You know how we tell the story. So when we go from the studio to a VT, the uh, VT op would spin the tape to the right time code and wait. And as soon as um, they were counted in, they push play, and the vision mixer would push the button, and the audio guy or girl would push up the fader. Right. So it's a three-person operation: <laughs> push, push, fade. So. Um, so these three people have to be in unison. Hence, that's why we have a director. It's like a, 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 a conductor in an orchestra. The director's saying standby camera one, standby VT one, and of course, the vision mixer, the audio person, and the uh, uh, VT person will go uh, five, four, three, two, one, and push the buttons at the same time. So it was a little bit like octopuses, right? Well, <laughs> if you have not one of these people, it is. So what else do we have in here? Usually, this was my old position. I was always next to the prompt operator, which I was always very grateful for because they were always lovely. Uh, the graphics, okay, so the graphics op will sit here. Now, the graphics responsibility here, they are fed into the vision mixer uh, as well, but with what is called key and fill, which allows them to do what you see here underneath. So um, there's a, a hole basically punched in the video by the key, and the fill is the thing underneath that's actually generating the color and the text in it. So there's two different things, the key and the fill. That's how you get graphics over live video, as I'm doing right here. Um, so a graphics op would be preparing graphics, playing graphics out, and along with the story, and again, everything driven by this script from the journalist that's been approved by the, the news editor. Uh, and when to push the button, etc. And again, that would be controlled by the, the director, you know, go graphic, standby graphic, cue graphic. Uh, up here, we would have engineering. I'll just call it ENG. Uh, you would have a, a, an engineer in charge, or, um, or, uh, but this was basically, they watched all the scopes, they, and they racked all the cameras. What does camera racking mean? It means basically opening and closing the iris of the camera to make sure things aren't overexposed. Uh, and again, to this day, you still have that. It's very important, particularly in football matches, especially when the, you've got half the field in dark and half the field in light, and it's a really hard job to rack that. It's, I've got a lot of admiration for guys that rack, and girls that rack cameras, really. But engineering here generally looked after the whole engineering of the whole uh, the building. If anything went wrong, you call the engineer. <laughs> Boy, you do, don't you either? Right, uh, so we got that. Um, then seeing here, um, we used to have... I'm not sure if this job still exists, maybe somebody can fill me in, but we used to have a script supervisor, call it SS, and the script supervisor sat there with a, uh, a stopwatch and the script, and they would call out what was happening. They were like, um, like an automation machine, they were amazing, they'd just sit there and go, uh, VT VT2 in 30 seconds, and of course then the VT ops, oh god, I need to get VT2 and plug it in and scroll around. So there's a lot of that going on. Okay, now, have I missed anything at all? I've got a horrible feeling I have. But uh, yes, it's pretty complex. Now, what happens next? Then coming out of the gallery here, we would have what is called TX out, okay? So TX out is the sum total of the vision mixer and the audio mixer coming out of the gallery. Uh, that meaning that all the graphics, the VTs, everything, the presenter, the, the prompt with the script on, everything has all come together and it's coming out as a single live signal. And that then would be sent to a place uh, over here, and I will call this place uh, MCR. And again, does still exist. Uh, and what MCR does is MCR plays out the whole channel. So they're, they, they're playing out the movies that you watched at Christmas. There was always some poor soul that was locked in here <laughs> for Christmas, playing out your Christmas movies. Uh, but they also choose when to go live. So they'll switch from a recorded thing or from a bumper or from an ad break or whatever to the live feed to put the news on air. So if you run over late, they will cut you off. You will just go, doosh, you disappear. So it's very important in the gallery, especially with the script supervisor's job there, to make sure that you hit the end point of your show exactly as you can. MCR will just literally cut you off. Where does it go from MCR? Well, it goes to the transmission tower, or at least it did in the 90s and the 80s. And from the transmission tower, it would be emitted over the airwaves. And then it would come down here to somebody's TV so that your viewer here is watching this story of the cat eating the dog. That whole process is what it took. And all these people and all this equipment to get this story about a cat and a dog all the way over here. Okay? So, now, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to try to demonstrate where this has changed 
uh, as the technologies changed. So when we went into digi beaters and stuff like that, uh, it, it changed a little. And, and one of the things that happened that was quite huge, uh, first of all, was first of all the change from running analog. So we used to have RGB and sync, that was four cables. Then we went to component, that was three cables because sync was on green. Nice. And then we went to what's called SDI, where everything is in one cable. And of course, that made this whole operation a lot more efficient because instead of four cables, we only had one cable for each signal. Um, so that was the actual move from analog to digital. Then we made the move from uh, digital to digital HD. So then we had to move from standard definition to a high definition picture, 1080p, uh, or 720p, actually, it would have been back then <laughs> when they started. Um, so once they made the move into this area and we were in digits, that's where the computers could start to play a role because now we can do this stuff inside computers instead of having to use all this analog tape and all this other stuff that the analog world needed. Um, so we started to see some changes and we also started to see some technological changes. Now, one of those changes, I'm going to start with the gallery. One of the changes was uh, automation. So automation came along um, and uh, the first uh, iterations of automation were, were uh, a bit of a shock to everybody, but I'm going to use yellow to try and demonstrate what happens with automation. Um, the automation would actually sit, I would guess, uh, about here. Let me just, I'm, I'm just, it would never be in the middle of the gallery, but I'm just going to say auto here, okay? So what the automation did was that the automation could control various pieces of equipment in the gallery uh, simultaneously. So one queue could do lots of things, right? So what the automation could control, for instance, is it could control the graphics machine. It could control um, the timings. So here for the script supervisor, it could take care of that job. It could control the vision mixer. It could control the VT decks. Uh, it could even control the audio mixer. Now you can start to see where I'm going now. <laughs> the automation made the gallery more efficient and reduced the amount of mistakes that were made on air. Because obviously with a lot of people like this, People are only human and people do make mistakes. Trust me, I've been told more times than I can shake a stick out that I'll never work in this industry again. Um, because when you make a mistake, it's, it's mortifying. Um, but the automation actually eradicates that. So it wasn't really an, a mechanism in trying to save money. It was more a mechanism in trying to make sure that we could eradicate as many mistakes as possible. However, of course, it did have uh, a knock-on effect. And that knock-on effect was that uh, you would lose your VT op, you'd lose your vision mixer. I'm being very drastic here because it doesn't happen in every case. Uh, you'd use your graphics op, you'd lose your script supervisor, right? Uh, and in some cases, you'd lose your sound person. That's, I'm gonna draw them back because sound people are so important. Uh, I'll draw a yellow sound person back uh, in here. So, um, but the automation really did change the layout in, in, in the uh, gallery, as you can see. Um, so, uh, what about the newsroom? Well, the newsroom, of course, it's very inefficient to have people running scripts and things and pieces of paper, and that also was very inefficient. So, what happened here was that we actually, uh, if I just get rid of that for a second, um, a system came along which is called a uh, newsroom control system. Newsroom control system. And the newsroom control system allowed uh, the journalists to write their scripts directly into it, and it was viewable by of course, everybody, so even the all the journalists and everything. So what we're doing here is centralizing all the script writing. And then the news editor is able to sort out a rundown of which order each thing should come in. And then, of course, the genius thing of linking the two things together, okay? So I'm gonna use green for this. What happens then is when you have a completed rundown, it could tell the automation uh, what was required from the rundown. And that meant that the journalists or the news editor could start adding, adding codes in here, you know, like camera one, VT2, uh, camera three, and those codes would be sent to the automation using something called MOS protocol. Uh, and that's a, a, a standard that you can send media files and uh, scripts, etc., with. So, of course, this could then send a script over to the prompter over here, uh, which unfortunately is another person out the gallery. Okay, uh, so the NRCS would then drive the uh, automation and we start to get a much more efficient operation happening around us. You see, we've still got a producer and a director, but in some cases you could actually merge that role. So you would only really have an engineer, possibly a sound person, 
and a director producer in the gallery. So there's a lot less people involved because of the automation and how that actually comes around. Um, this is pretty much where we are today. Uh, things haven't really changed very much since we evolved into this situation. Uh, most of the reason why that to get all of this work in is what you might call the valley of tears. It's really hard. Trust us, we've done it. Um, getting all these pieces of equipment to talk to each other is, is, is difficult and there can be issues around uh, synchronization, etc. And so it can be very, very hard. So it's a bit like um, a, a living, breathing person that you must keep alive all the time. So it's, uh, it's a pretty tricky job for the engineers still. Uh, and some of these protocols, like MOS is a pretty old protocol. And also something about, uh, I don't know if I should say it or not, but one of the things about MOS is it's not um, secure. So if somebody could get into your network here, you can actually launch a man in the middle attack here and write your own text to the prompter. Uh, because, because it's unauthenticated and it's not uh, encrypted. So the prompter doesn't ask who's sending the message. It would simply just put it up on the prompter. So, you know, there are things here that are, uh, need to change. Again, you know, we're moving into another phase. Uh, but this is where I would say roughly currently we are in the present. So, what about the future? Well, I think this year we're going to hear the word consolidation a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot, because Still, there's all these sort of, I think as they call it, best of breed devices for things. But the, the problem is you have to have like, a, you have to have a VT machine, you have to buy another VT machine for redundancy purposes, and so you've got to buy two, and you know, and this talks to MOS in a different way to that. So, you know, so what we need to do is try to consolidate a lot of this. Um, and actually, you know, if I end up talking a little bit salesy, but it's still, it's relevant. Is that's what, exactly what Next does. And there are other products coming onto the market now that will be doing this, uh, as you'll start to see in this year. And there's going to be a big conversation about consolidation. And what does consolidation mean? Well, consolidation actually means this. If I was to take my hand here and just, ooh, I was going for drama and I didn't get any. I'm just going to wipe out everything apart from that edit suite here. And I'm going to wipe out everything in here down to the vision mixer. And, uh, oh, maybe I can just use my eraser here. And I'm going to wipe out the WTs, and I'm going to keep the audio mixer. Yes, OK. So I should just go back to white. Uh, so I've got a vision mixer. I've got an audio mixer. Uh, and I have some prompter hoods here in the studio. OK? That's all I've got here. I've changed the newsroom completely, OK? But I still do have this central point, and I still do have my news editor here. So what we've done at Next, really, is we've tried to remove this line. Because this line is a boundary between two different worlds. And we need to consolidate together all the information that everybody's passing around in the industry. Now, the reason for that is our viewer over here is not just watching it on TV. Our viewer here has a mobile phone. And our viewer is also looking at their phone while they're looking at the TV. And someone else in the house has got a tablet here, you know, and they're looking at Netflix or something on their tablet. And this TV is now a smart TV, so it has apps and it has uh, all sorts of things built into it to, to, you know, gain the attention of the viewer, for instance, okay? And then you have computers, you know, people are looking at stuff on their computers and their laptops as well. So the devices here are very different. And this over the air thing, although linear TV, and I don't think linear TV is dead by any means, I still think there's a place for linear TV. But these devices can actually allow the, the uh, viewer to sort of talk back to what's going on in the studio here. And that's a link that would be interesting to connect up. That will help linear TV, I think, to, to ride this wave. Um, now, how do we get to these devices as well? This is problematic with this situation. Now I have to have a digital team installed down here and it all gets a bit more complicated. If we consolidate things, uh, and as I say, if we can actually say, okay, what we don't want anymore is this line here. He says, I'll just rub it out like this and put my news editor back in. In fact, I'll lose my director and producer and news editor for a second here, and I'm going to lose the automation here. And I'll just draw back in my line to the gallery here. So what I've got is an edit suite, and I've got a vision mixer, and an audio desk, and a studio. Okay? What we've done here is some... Um, in our case, at least, we put Next Edition in here. Now, this could be an on-prem solution because I'll show you what the cloud comes in in a minute. But 
basically what we do is we consolidate a lot of these processes. So you go out to get the cat dog story and you come back in. Uh, so here's our journalist and our journalist comes back in and they ingest it right into here, into the next system. Okay, now next of course it has a built-in MAM, PAM, whatever words is currently fashionable, uh, but that's built in. Now of course our news editor over here uh, can also see everything in here, but our news editor over here is actually sitting at home using a VPN connection over the internet. And they're able to see this stuff that's come in here. Meanwhile the journalist is going to write the NRCS script directly into Next. And it's possible for the news editor, for instance, to take this VT that's been transcoded, for instance, and just drop that into the script and drop that into the rundown. So a lot of the processes that were going on before over here have now been consolidated into one particular lump here. Now, also, what Next does is we put in a couple of servers. They're basically uh, outboxes, two outputs. One is graphics out and one is VT out. Now, the only reason for that is because we have to support baseband going into the Vision Mixer. So we've got A and B, and we've got graphics. So maybe I put a piece of kit back in, but it's still attached to this swarm. So we're using microservices here. And inside the microservices swarm, we can stream the videos and stream the graphics directly from Next. So the rundown here, the script, and this is a very fundamental point. We have a single source of truth now, okay? So we haven't got multiple copies of scripts flying around on paper where people have crossed things off on some but not others. We don't have a handoff from an NRCS system to an automation system that can't talk backwards. We actually have a single script that drives everything. And as a result of that, um, everything is recorded and we know exactly what happens and it's available for everybody to see if they have permission, I hasten to add. Everything happening in here is encrypted. It's totally encrypted and authenticated. So this is a very secure environment that they're living in. Uh, in the gallery here, um, what next edition will do here is we will, I will take green again for automation. Um, we will control the visual mixer and we will control the audio mixer. The reason for that is if you already have that in place, it's great. Also, if you want to start reintroducing people, so if I wanted to have a vision mixer pushing buttons here, that's no problem. If I want my audio person sitting here, that is also no problem at all. Um, so let's go back to the automation here. So the automation can take control of that. The automation also takes control of the VTs and the graphics, but again, from one centralized point, from one single source of truth, which is the script in the rundown. Um, now, as a result of that, you've got this enormous amount of consolidation. It's fully available everywhere uh, in the world, just coming in via a VPN. Um, we can even actually uh, stick something in MCR here that's also connected to, uh, to Next here. And then on top of all of that, of course, we have the advantage that we can post things to social. We can post things directly to this user's phone. We can post things directly to this tablet. Now, whether, what, what could that be? It could be that, you know, while we're recording our TX out here, we can use a process called salami slicing. So for instance, if this is the user watching a dance show and we step out of the story of the dance into the judging story, next we'll actually slice off a video here which is called a salami slice, like a sausage. And we can automatically post that to the user's device so they can watch the dance while the judging is going on. So that kind of concept, which is very, very new, is very, very normal to us and others who are building software like this in microservice environments. Um, when it comes to cloud, let's talk about that. So in terms of disaster recovery here, um, everybody has disaster recovery solutions. Um, usually that means just building a very similar but slightly smaller uh, operation uh, that mirrors this somewhere else. Um, but we have with, uh, with Nextcloud is the ability to, um, if I'm going to draw the worst cloud you ever saw. <laughs> okay, we have the ability to have up in the sky in Nextcloud what is called replication. Now, what does replication mean? It's not syncing. Replication is different to syncing. It means that when journalists are writing their scripts in here, we are constantly replicating those scripts into the cloud, constantly. When these ingests are happening, and this VT, for instance, uh, comes in, it's up to the client in this case, because sometimes you have, uh, it's extremely expensive to move things around, but we can either transcode like a satellite file that's a mezzanine file, and then we move that up here. And what we can do is reconstruct the rundown in the cloud. Camera one, VT two, okay? 
constantly, and it's constantly replicating between there and there. So if, for instance, the power to all of this just dies, this journalist can switch on their mobile phone and log into Nextcloud and carry on where they were left off as though nothing happened because it's not doing a timed sync. It's actually syncing in a, or well, it's not syncing, it's replicating um, all the time to the cloud. So you have a perfect copy. Uh, and that way, should something awful happen, then Nextcloud can take over the playout, for instance, of a linear channel or even if it's uh, a stream that's going, you know, to a YouTube on someone's computer, the, the system can just jump in and take over that scenario. So, it's quite a complex diagram. <laughs> it's a lot to talk about. I hope you found it interesting. I've gone over my half an hour a little bit, but um, uh, I will look at the questions and answer them in the thing because I have run over a little bit. So, uh, But thanks for joining in, everybody.